I'm Mike Scruggs, and I'm an Air Force combat veteran of the Vietnam War. And I'm here today to interview a combat veteran, Marine of the Vietnam War. Nick War, congratulations on your latest book, Charlie One Five. Charlie Company, 1st Battalion, 5th Marine Regiment, a Marine Companies, Vietnam. You are a second lieutenant platoon infantry leader and eventually became a company commander. I read your book, your first book, uh, Phase Line Green, and I could hardly put it down. It was so interesting and engrossing. And you had a style there. Uh, this was about the Tet Offensive, 1968 in Vietnam, which is one of the bloodiest times. And you have a style here that you've continued in this book, which I think makes for great books. And, and it's gonna have an impact. I know uh, Phase Line Green has had a terrific impact on the Marine Corps in their tactics and in their, in their leadership. But you also have a gift of wording things and saying things straight from the heart. They're not filtered, they're not restricted, they don't have any static, it's just pure truth. And this book is a book about people, it's a book, book about Marines. In fact, there are, I think, over 25 stories in this book about Marines. And it's a book about combat, it's a book about courage, but I think Preeminently, it's a book about leadership. Nick War, how did you become a Marine? Well, first of all, Mike, <clears throat> thank you so much for your kind words about my books. I really appreciate that. And uh, uh, the way I became a Marine is I enlisted in 1966. I was a college dropout, bored, looking for something to do. Uh, I decided to join the military at age 20. And my brothers, my four brothers, and my father's brothers, uh, six of them, all served in the military, in the Army or the Navy. And so I chose the Marine Corps. I went to boot camp in uh, June of 1966 at MCRD San Diego. Uh, graduated in August of 1968. Uh, became a U.S. Marine, one of the proudest moments of my life. I was uh, recommended for the enlisted commissioning program at a boot camp and ended up uh, four months later at Quantico, Virginia uh, in the officer candidate school, which is where you become a brown bar, a second lieutenant. I then went through the basic school, which is where they teach you how to be a Marine officer, and ended up in the middle of November 1967 in a place called the Republic of Vietnam of what we call the country of South Vietnam. Why did you write the book? What was your motivation? Well, first of all, uh, my book writing began, as you mentioned, with Phase Lang Green, which is a memoir of my uh, experiences as a Marine platoon commander, infantry platoon commander, uh, where we ended up in the battle for Way City during the Tet Offensive of 1968. It was honestly a form of therapy. Uh, the experiences I had as a platoon commander during the Vietnam War, and in particular during Way, uh, I have many great memories. I also have many very challenging memories. And uh, about 20 years after I got out of the Marine Corps, um, I found that those memories were beginning to affect my life. And I sought therapy and I uh, learned that one of the things you can do to deal with these kinds of memories is to write it down and share it with others, so I did. Fortunately for me, uh, the book was published. Um, uh, fairly rare for a first-time author to be published by a major university press. Uh, I had some help in that regard. A good friend of mine, Lieutenant Colonel Alex Lee, United States Marine Corps retired, read my manuscript, and he had been published twice so he introduced me to the acquisitions editor there at Naval Institute Press, and the rest, as they say, is history, a history book. 
Uh, the book was very well uh, received in the Marine Corps in particular, and I'm very pleased with that. Uh, so that's where it started. Charlie One Five came about as the result of attending reunions from 1997 on until the present time. Uh, because of the first book, I've uh, heard from many of my fellow Marines that I served with in Vietnam and uh, we're now part of a, of a veterans organization. We have a reunion every year. And during those reunions, I listen. I don't talk too much, I listen. And the stories are unbelievable and they get better every year, as we say. Uh, but I felt um, a real motivation to tell these guys stories. So as you indicated, the second book, Charlie One Five, is uh, a, a, a number of stories from about 25 different veterans, from rifleman to battalion commander, uh, during the early years of the war, from 1965 until just before Tet broke out. So I call it a prequel. It's a little different, you know, Phase Line Green was a memoir. This book is, it does contain some of my own stories and memories but it's predominantly the combat operations of the 1st Battalion, 5th Marine Regiment during the early years of the war. Well, one thing that stands out about the book, it is a book about combat, but on almost every page, the theme of leadership comes up. Do you want to talk about leadership some? Yes, actually, uh, that's a real good observation, Mike, because what I've learned uh, during my time in the Marine Corps and since uh, is that leadership really is the religion of the United States Marine Corps and the American military. Uh, the business of war fighting is a very serious business. It's very risky. It's very hazardous. And if you do not have good leadership, and by that I mean effective leadership, and if you don't have effective leadership in times when people are shooting at you, things can get really ugly very fast. And in my experiences in combat, I saw leadership that did come from above us in the chain of command. I also saw young men who were privates and PSCs and corporals and sergeants who rose to the occasion and demonstrated the traits and principles of a true leader in a critical situation making a huge difference. So. Um, one of the things that I feel very strongly about is that since war is really about human beings, it's about people, and it is a very difficult situation. It's a cauldron. Uh, people's lives are at stake virtually every day. That leadership is one of the very important keys to success. And the Marine Corps, uh, about 25 years ago, adopted a set of uh, leadership principles and a set of leadership traits that they teach. It's, it's difficult to teach leadership, uh, but it is possible. And from the beginning, from uh, OCS through the basic school, and today in the case of the Inf Infantry Officers course, uh, those principles and traits are, are really uh, related over and over and over again into the curriculum that these young men go through. Extremely important. What's your recollection of Vietnam, the country, and its people? Well, it really is an incredibly exotic place. Um, I found myself in 1967 and 1968 looking around me virtually everywhere I went, and if you had a camera and just took a snapshot it would be a great uh, postcard instantly. It's beautiful places, wonderful uh, views, very scenic, uh, very exotic, uh, lots of water buffalo, rice paddies all over the place. And I found myself thinking, gee, you know, if they could sim figure out a way to build uh, hotels and, and airports and golf courses, you know, people would come to this place and, and maybe the war would be over. And actually that's what's going on today. Vietnam is going through a, some challenges, but they're going through dramatic growth. And one of the things that's happening is international resorts are springing up in, in the country that we now know today as Vietnam. 
what kind of living conditions or fighting conditions does a marine company in Vietnam usually have to put up with? Well, excuse me, <coughs> it's not a lot of fun. <laughs> That's why I think marine training is so challenging. Uh, you need to be prepared for the fight, but you also need to be prepared for the environment. The, um, the weather is just one element of many. Um, at one point during my tour, towards the end of my tour, I lived through a typhoon, which was, it was 24 inches of rain in one day with high winds, and the entire area that we, we were in was flooded. Buildings were blown away, and uh, it was actually kind of nice because the war stopped. We couldn't move, the enemy couldn't move, we just stayed where we were until the waters receded. Uh, the wildlife and the animals were a hazard. There were some significant um, poisonous snakes, uh, insects, spiders, things of that nature. Um, it, the, one of the things that was a great challenge is there was so much beauty in the countryside there that you would find yourself getting distracted. And you can't be distracted when you're out on a patrol or you're on a sweep or something like that. So. The actual um, environment we were in was as much of a challenge as the enemy that we were facing. Uh, heavy rains, uh, you're either in a rice paddy or you're in a village, not too often, but sometimes you're in a village. Um, you're up in the side of a very steep mountain in the middle of a downpour. Sometimes the jungle could be what they call triple canopy, which is you can't see 10 feet in front of you and there's, the sunlight is virtually blocked off. Uh, very steep, rugged mountains. So the terrain itself was, was a challenge. And of course, when we you know, went into Way City, that was a different kind of a challenge because all of a sudden we found ourselves in an urban environment fighting in people's houses, which was very, very strange. Well, it's a, it's a book of stories, and some of the stories and some of the people uh, stand out particularly, but they're all good. But one young man that uh, sort of struck me as standing out is one that probably didn't think he was going to be a combat infantry marine, but he winds up on a lot of pages of your book. It's Craig Jackson. I think he was eventually a sergeant. Yeah, Sergeant Craig Jackson was a real character. Um, I loved interviewing him. He fought in... Um, uh, Bravo Company, Delta Company, 1-5, for an, a number of months in the, the Quezon Valley, which was uh, the Marines called VC Valley. It was uh, slightly north of Chulai and quite a ways west. Uh, and when the 1st Battalion, 5th Marines first went out there during Operation Union 1, Craig was one of those young men who went on that, and uh, he saw a lot of very, very difficult fighting. He could always retain his sense of humor in the midst of some kind of incredible uh, war fighting that was going on. So he was there during Operation Union 1, Union 2, and SWIFT, which was probably the worst um, and most uh, difficult uh, combat operation that 1-5 experienced during the entire war. They took an awful lot of casualties. Uh, but Sergeant Jackson, Craig, my friend, uh, did an outstanding job of being a a non-commissioned officer leader. Another one that stands out to me is Rusty. Uh, Rusty, Rusty, Rustiff, I think it is. John Rust. John Rust was a Lance Corporal. And uh, that's third notch up on the totem pole of the enlisted guys. He was a fire team leader, uh, which basically means that he had three Marines that were part of his fire team. That's the basic uh, maneuver unit of the United States Marine Corps Infantry. And Rusty uh, also served in 1967 uh, during those difficult operations out there in um, the Quezon Valley. As a matter of fact, he was in Charlie Company and his company fought an NVA regiment, a force of about a thousand fighters. Charlie Company had about 220 Marines at the time but they found themselves at point-blank range on this obscure terrain feature called Hill 110 and fought uh, that day for seven hours nonstop and ended up pretty much destroying that NVA regiment. 
despite the fact that on that particular day, the company commander was not able to get the typical air support that he had, he, he had been using all along and could not get artillery support because the artillery battery had picked that moment to move. So their um, howitzers were behind their trucks and they were moving from point A to point B. Despite that, the Marines fought off this regiment for seven straight hours. And during that time, Charlie Company had 10 Marines killed and 44 wounded, badly wounded. And they were in an exposed position most of the day. They found themselves on the forward slope of this hill and the enemy was in a, um, a uh, cane field down at the bottom of the hill. Uh, and if you moved at all, you're gonna get shot at and, and sometimes obviously be shot. Uh, Rusty was one of several Marines who made, he, he made 10 trips from the bottom of the hill to the top of the hill with wounded. Uh, he was actually recommended for the Medal of Honor for his valor that day. He was awarded the Navy Cross. He's one of those guys who just say, hey, I was just doing my job. Just an outstanding young man and one of our heroes. Another fellow that, that struck me as uh, almost entertaining, if you can talk about entertaining in, under such harrowing condition, is Sergeant Hillis York. <laughs> Uh, Hillis York, <coughs> excuse me, is from Kentucky, and he's actually related to the famous World War I Sergeant York, Sergeant Alvin York, a distant relative of his, and he was drafted, but then he found himself in a recruiting station, and a couple of Marine recruiters showed up and asked for volunteers. And so he, he raised his hand. He said, you know, and I just had that thought at that moment that if I'm going to go to war, I might as well go with the best. And it turned out he was the only one to volunteer of all that group. Uh, but then uh, as he moved into the uh, Marine Corps line with those recruiters, they came back to the group and picked out several more and said, you're coming with me. You're now a United States Marine. Uh, Hillis had a great sense of humor, but he was also one of those those leaders, he had, he had a knack of, of getting people to do what needed to be done in very difficult circumstances without really just saying, hey, I'm the boss and, and you're, you need to do this. He, he just had a knack for it. Uh, he, was, uh, a, he grew up in the woods, he was a good shot, he, was, he was really knew um, how to um, track things and those, those sort of things. Hillis got the Silver Star during his tour in Vietnam and was a, really an outstanding young man. Well, one person I know was very significant to you is uh, Staff Sergeant John Mullen, that they called Mother Mullen, the troops called him. The troops called him Mother, or sometimes Mother, depending on the circumstances. Uh, John was a professional. He's what some people would um, cynically call a lifer. Uh, because he planned to be in the Marine Corps for the rest of his life. Uh, but he loved the Marine Corps, and his goal in life was to become the, sar the Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps. When I met him, uh, it was the day, the first day I arrived in Vietnam, uh, and was given command of the 1st Platoon of Charlie Company. And it turns out that John had been doing that job um, for two months in combat, had already survived several uh, skirmishes and battles and situations with command detonated bombs and, and, and booby traps and so forth. So I looked to John as someone who knew the job very intimately. Uh, there had been a lieutenant uh, of that platoon, but he had um, badly injured his knee and had to go home. So John did the job for two months and I showed up and I took him aside and said, uh, listen, John, I, I really feel like uh, I, I know what I'm doing, but I think there may be more to this than I've learned. And I would really like it if you would help me through this power curve. My greatest fear of being a Marine leader was doing something stupid that would get one of my men killed. I, that, that fear was with me every day that I was in Vietnam in particular. And John knew what 
I should be doing and what I should not be doing. So he did that. And for about a month, um, we would meet early every morning. He'd say, okay, I'd like you to go do this. And I took my bars off and I basically uh, did the jobs of those Marines. I carried a rifle, I went on patrols, I went on ambushes, I listened to the squad leaders who were sometimes corporals or lance corporals and sometimes sergeants. And after a month, um, John came to me and said, okay, you're, you're ready, Lieutenant, and, and then I took command. None of our men knew that we were doing that because they might have been a little concerned uh, but it was probably the smartest thing I did in the 13 months I spent in Vietnam, is to listen to John. Uh, <clears throat> the reason John is very special to me is that uh, today is that he, as we move three, three months later into the Citadel Fortress of Wei, uh, not really understanding what we were getting into, even though this battle had been going on for two weeks, uh, we, we later found out that we were outnumbered about five to one, uh, that the enemy was waiting for us and had prepared uh, very good defensive positions. Uh, and we were also very heavily restricted by our own chain of command and by our civilian leaders on what's called rules of engagement. Um, this was a, an urban fight. This was a situation where we have a superior enemy force in very well prepared defensive positions and yet our chain of command, our leaders and our, in particular our civilian leaders of both the United States and South Vietnam had decided that since the city of Hue is an extremely important symbolic city to the Vietnamese people that they didn't want to damage any of the buildings which basically meant that we would have to do this job which was to attack and destroy the enemy forces holding the citadel without any heavy weapons. No airstrikes, no artillery. We actually had a couple of tanks in support, but they were on direct orders not to fire their cannons. We could use our small arms, we could use our um, rifles and machine guns, and that was basically it. And on that first morning, when we actually uh, confronted the enemy, when the, in the very first fight, uh, John was on the left side of my platoon and I was in the center. And when the first um, fight began, which it lasted for three weeks after this, uh, two of our Marines went down hard in the street, exposed to enemy gunfire. And John uh, ran out in the street one at a time, pulled those Marines back in under fire to safety, and then he went out to help a third Marine, and just as he was going out the door, an, an enemy RPG, which is a rocket-propelled grenade, uh, was fired from about 50 yards away and went right, right by John's head, blew up in the back of the room that he was in, threw him out in the street, at which time he was shot in the head. Uh, he, was, um, he was alive, uh, but my corpsman told me that his, uh, the side of his skull had been blown off, his ear was detached, he could see his brain, and he honestly didn't think that John was going to survive. When I found that out, it was definitely, Mike, the worst, worst moment of my life. This is a, an outstanding American, a great guy, a very skilled professional leader, someone that I had relied on constantly every single day and now he's gone just in the heart in a heartbeat he's gone um, so uh, John did survive his wounds he spent a year in uh, Philadelphia in Naval Hospital for a deep brain injury but he survived and went on to um, have a wonderful family and retired twice once as a school teacher and one work uh, he worked for the Postal Service for a number of years so we have a great opportunity every year we get together at our reunions and I know that I, I really owe him a lot because he taught me what I needed to know. I want you to talk about a minute about uh, your company commander Scott Nelson and then the next question I want you to go on to the weapons uh, that you most feared. Okay. Scott Nelson was another um, natural leader. 
Uh, when he arrived in Vietnam, it was actually the first day of the Tet Offensive. I had been there two and a half months. Uh, Scott was a first lieutenant. Normally, a company commander is a captain, another notch above. But we, our battalion did not have captains available. And so when Scott arrived, I believe it was on February 1st or January 31st, uh, he was assigned the job of being the company commander of Charlie Company, which is the company I was, had been serving with since November 15th. And he took command. It took him two or three days to get to us because the entire countryside is fighting for their lives. The North Vietnamese Army had come down out of the mountains in force uh, during the Tet Offensive. Uh, their intention was to win this war at that moment in time. They committed 30 to 40 percent of their forces. And um, Scott basically took command under fire. Um, he also had the knack of getting me to do things I didn't really want to do without commanding me that I had to do it. He just was really good at it. He was an excellent leader. How about the most feared weapons? There's no question in my mind during the 13 months I spent in Vietnam that the worst weapon we were up against, um, honestly all of them are fearful, but the command detonated bomb, which is what the young Marines today call, refer to as an improvised explosive device, was absolutely the worst. It was worse psychologically because the enemy had a knack of, they, were, they had a lot of guts. If we fired an artillery round and it didn't explode, it was a dud round, they would dig that up out of the ground and turn it against us. Uh, aerial bombs, mortar rounds, things of that nature. So typically the command detonated bomb was one or more of those rigged to a detonator and they would plant them in areas that they knew we would eventually come down a road or a trail and wait until we were standing right over the top of them at which time they would explode it. Uh, devastating, absolutely devastating. Booby traps, um, other kinds of mines, punji pits, they're, they're very scary but the command detonated bomb, without question, was the most devastating. Well, Nick, there's lots I'd like to ask. It's a great book, and uh, everybody could, should read it. I think it's going to have another significant impact on the Marine Corps and well, the Army you. and the Air Force and the Navy. I appreciate you saying that, Mike, so, very much. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.